Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Matt Kelly for another episode of the award-winning Compliance into the Weeds. Matt, welcome back from Thanksgiving. Hello, Tom. It's good to be here. Well, Matt, this was for a short three-day business week. It was one of the most memorable of uh, corporate governance, FCPA, anti-money laundering, and a variety of other things we've had. And I'm not sure this was the biggest or the most explosive, but $4 billion in penalties for Binance. Where do we start? That is a good place. A uh, good question. I like you hardly know where to start with Binance because I do think that the financial penalties levied against Binance last week, largest cryptocurrency trading platform in the world, they are huge. Uh, $4.3 billion in total between the Justice Department. The Commodity Futures and Trading Commission, uh, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, and FinCEN, the uh, fin money laundering agency in the United States. Collectively, $4.3 billion fine. Um, the company pleaded guilty. They are subject to a three-year plea agreement. Meanwhile, FinCEN and OFAC have imposed a compliance monitor for five years. Uh, the company's CEO, or now former CEO, uh, Chengpeng Zhao, who just goes by the name CZ, I think because everybody in crypto just uses their own initials. So uh, CZ, he pleaded guilty. He resigned. He is looking at uh, up to at least 18 months in prison, I think, possibly longer. Uh, he won't be sentenced until sometime early next year. The former CCO, Samuel Lim, uh, he also is now about to settle charges with the CFTC, not criminal charges, civil charges with the CFTC, where he's looking at a $1.5 million fine and some pretty severe restrictions and obligations he will have as a compliance professional in the future, should he go back to being a compliance officer again someday. Um, the ex-CCO, Samuel Lim, like I don't even know who might give him a job, but maybe somebody would. But I mean, we could talk about the CCO's role in this. We could talk about the extensive monitorship that uh, Binance will have to labor under now for five years. We could talk about what this means for other cryptocurrency ventures, because clearly the Justice Department and other regulators are telling the crypto world, knock it off. You people are finance firms and we're going to treat you like finance firms and your libertarian fantasies that you don't have to obey AML laws and other financial regulation. Get over that. That's like that's not happening. You will have to be regulated. That's clearly the message the Justice Department was saying. So, I mean, we could go on about finance and all of its many splendor dysfunctions for the rest of the week. Well, let me start with Mr. Lim first, because uh, he clearly has a model in place now from the former general counsel of FTX, whose law firm, new law firm tagline is, we've learned from our mistakes, uh, come to the best. So perhaps he could open up his own consulting firm, uh, not representing financial institutions or U.S. public companies. But, um, man, I guess my first question is, this was clearly, to me, a criminal enterprise. They pled guilty to a criminal charge. Um, there wasn't a failure of controls or not even no controls. It was they were completely evading con controls intentionally. Uh, was that your sense or do you have a different sense? No, I think that's right. And that's an important point for compliance professionals who want to study the Binance case and say, OK, what lessons could I learn from Binance and what mistakes did they make that I should avoid? I mean, when you think about it, Binance didn't make any mistakes. Everything Binance did, they did deliberately. They deliberately lied about their anti-money laundering controls. They deliberately short shrifted their compliance program in pretty much every single element of the seven elements of an effective compliance program. They ignored all seven elements of that. Uh, they deliberately you know, allowed U.S. customers to do business with finance when they had said, we don't do that because we're not a registered exchange in the United States. They deliberately ignored uh, anti-money laundering and sanctions laws when they let uh, sanctioned entities and customers from Iran and Syria and North Korea and everywhere else do business on Binance. Um, so that's an important distinction here is that there was intent to deceive 
and evade and have a false compliance program. And if you read through the settlement documents, you see that a lot, is that CZ and Samuel Lim were thick as thieves in designing a cosmetic compliance program that looked good on paper or on the website, but in fact uh, was not enforced internally at all. And there are many instances cited in the settlement documents about how CZ and Lim would and full well knew that they were evading compliance uh, regulations and policies and procedures and saying one thing about, oh, we totally take this seriously. And then inside we're saying, but of course we don't take this seriously. Of course, we're still letting sanctioned customers on or we're still letting U.S. partner customers on when we said that we're not. It's It was lies and deception all the way down. And um, that really uh, brings up for me, another additional point with Mr. Lim, Matt, which was the Securities and Exchange Commission, who is not a party to this agreement, has basically a tripartite test for individual CCO liability. The first is uh, if you're grossly negligent or simply don't do your job. The second is uh, you don't get the resources required to do your job. And the third is if you're part of the scheme or the scam. And clearly, this falls into camp three, part of the scheme or the scam. And to me, this reinforces what the SEC says should be a uh, suggested framework for CCO liability. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I've always thought, and this is not news to people who have listened to this podcast before, that the fears of CCO liability are overblown. Um, Regulators really don't want to hold CCOs accountable for or hold them liable for misconduct by the company unless you're a total mess at your job, which occasionally happens, or you're in on the misconduct, which was the case here with Mr. Lim. Uh, there was one clause uh, cited, I think, by FinCEN. I was reading through their settlement decree, which is 92 pages, where uh, Lim was quoted talking with another employee saying, well, we don't do business openly with customers in Iran. So we're just doing business with customers in Iran non-openly. That was the actual phrase that he used. We we're doing business with sanctioned entities non-openly. Like He knew full well that this was something that he was engaging in that was uh, breaking the law. So I have little sympathy for Mr. Lim. Um, my favorite detail is that he was believed to live in Singapore. But when the CFTC tried to serve a subpoena to him, Binance would not provide a delivery address, like a mailing address. So for a while, the CFTC didn't actually know exactly where Mr. Lim was, leading to all sorts of fun headlines, Lim on the lamb. Um, I guess they finally found him because he has now at least agreed to the tentative settlement order. It has to go before a federal judge for final approval here. But um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, like, if you are as fully engaged in misconduct as the CCO here with Binance, what do you think is going to happen? Um, it really is just a testament to the fact that most times when we see something about a CCO falling afoul of regulators, like in almost every instance, it's because that CCO deserves it. Either they were grossly negligent at their job or they were deliberately malfeasant. And that was the case here. Matt, you mentioned the monitorship. Um, the Wall Street Journal reported that there was a five-year monitorship Im imposed. John um, Reed Stark reported there was a three-year monitorship imposed, but whichever it is, uh, it's got to be a very robust monitorship given the allegations uh, Binance agreed to. Yes. So uh, FinCEN and OFAC together have uh, agreed to, I guess we'll call it a joint monitor uh, appointment. Uh, that monitor will be with Binance for five years, not three. There is a three-year term to the plea agreement with the Justice Department. But on the civil side with FinCEN and, and with OFAC, it's a five-year monitor. Um, this monitor will do all the things that we have come to expect with monitors. Is you know, They're going to do a top-to-bottom review of the compliance program and make sure that the newly reconstituted program at Binance with whoever is going to wind up running it, which I'm still not clear on who that will be over the long term, uh, that they do have a strong tone at the top, strong training, 
testing, independent um, validation and assessment of the program and all the other fun stuff. I did think that what's interesting is in addition to the monitor for five years, the monitor will then have authority to basically compel Binance to hire two more people. I guess they're called consultants, but I guess they're kind of independent quasi-monitors or sub-monitors. But one person will be a consultant to review the suspicious activity reporting for the last, I think, five years. This person, the SAR consultant, is going to do a look back of all transactions at Binance, all, uh, for 2018 through 2022 to identify any transactions that should have triggered a suspicious activity report, but then Binance never filed one, which is a big part of the misconduct at issue here is they had you know, a very weak and ineffective, by choice, by design, a weak and ineffective SAR reporting program. Um, so they're going to look at that, find the suspicious activity that should have been reported and never was, and then Binance will have to resubmit updated SARs for all of those transactions that should have been SARed in the first place, but never were. Consultant number one. Consultant number two, then, is going to do a top-to-bottom review of the anti-money laundering program. Uh, that person will have to be an AML expert, uh, but they will essentially do the same sort of thing the monitor's doing for the entire ethics and compliance program, where they're looking at the tone at the top and policies and procedures and whatnot. Um, Ultimately, what was going on here was that Binance had no real anti-money laundering, no real know-your-customer due diligence screening, um, and no real suspicious activity reporting. Uh, so all three of those things are going to need massive upgrades and improvements, some of which Binance has been making for the last probably year or so as regulators kind of tightened the noose around it and indicted the company and LIM and CZ and all this other stuff. Uh, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be do that needs to be done in the next couple of years. So we have this outside monitor who's going to do it, and these two consultant sub monitors uh, who are going to be looking specifically at the SAR program and at the AML program. Um, and all three of these people and their attendance staff are going to cost Binance a lot of money, and they're going to be with Binance for a long, long time. Matt, one of the things that intrigued me was how the United States was able to get CZ to voluntarily come to our country to plead guilty uh, when apparently he's not subject. He, he holds a UAE passport uh, with a non -ext There is no extradition treaty, so they couldn't compel his attendance. Now he's here and a federal district judge, at least as of the time of this recording, stayed a magistrate order which allowed him to return to the UAE before his sentencing. Um, once again, citing to John Reed Stark, who has opined that although uh, he may get a <clears throat> slap on the wrist a few months in prison, he thinks the DOJ could ask for up to 10 years. Um, it seems to me that Mr. CZ himself took a huge risk coming to the United States uh, to plead guilty, even if voluntar voluntarily. Any thoughts on that point? I think it's a good question, and I don't know. Um, I mean, I am all for cooperating with law enforcement and doing the right thing, and CZ did because he came here to face the music. But ultimately, I don't know that we had all that much ability to compel him. Um, it's not like he was going to be extradited from the UAE to come here. But uh, yes, now he is facing, um, I believe it is at least 18 months in prison and possibly much more. Um, anybody who is a diehard fanatic following crypto news, I would recommend that you follow John Reed Stark on LinkedIn and Twitter, who is a former SEC enforcement attorney and um, outspoken cynic and critic of all things crypto, which I agree with John on that entirely, that crypto really doesn't do much except to uh, aid and abet tax evasion and money laundering and libertarian Ayn Rand fanboys who think that they can somehow avoid, you know, doing their civic duty to pay taxes or otherwise play within a larger regulatory system. Crypto is really fraud stem to stern. John Reed uh, Stark takes that view. I do too. Uh, but back to Mr. CZ, I don't even know, you know like, what they would have done to be able to get him there. Um, but he did come here. And now I 
believe he's going to be a guest of the United States until his sentencing, which is typically six to nine months after a guilty plea. So it will be probably sometime next spring or summer when we find out what's going to happen to him. Matt, maybe we could explore something you started with, which was um, the end of this uh, libertarian experiment around cryptocurrency, an alternative financial system. Uh, if I could book in this guilty plea with the uh, guilty conviction, or the conviction rather, of Sam Bankman Fried, one SBF, and his fraud around FTX. This was not fraud. This was a criminal enterprise. But do these two uh, enforcement actions or, or court cases really spell the end of crypto as a true alternative? Um, I think so. Or actually, I would say Binance is like the by far the largest enforcement action we've seen in the crypto world. Sam Bankman Fried is, I think it's coincidental that he made his fraud in crypto. I'm pretty sure he probably would have been a basket case committing fraud no matter what enterprise or industry he went into. But I actually look at Binance and all the other many smaller crypto enforcement actions we've seen over the last several years um, and take them all together. I think it is regulators sending a message to the crypto people that get over yourselves. You are not in some libertarian regulatory free zone. You are part of the U.S. jurisdiction if you are doing business in the United States or handling U.S. assets or working with U.S. customers. You have to obey U.S. law. Um, and you know, there we could talk about some specific failures I have seen over and over again, but it really is more about, you know, telling the crypto sector that there will be regula regulation, there will be enforcement, you will have to do this, and you know whether that is some huge enforcement action such as with Binance, or some smaller one that we see typically on the civil side from OFAC where they might sanction a much smaller crypto trading platform for failure to implement geofencing controls. So some of your transactions are with people in Cuba. Um, a lot of these companies, I wonder how sophisticated they are and did they really understand what they were doing? Probably not. I do not put Binance in that case. Binance knew exactly what it was doing and it was certainly big enough and sophisticated enough to obey the law if it so chose. And they did not. So. Finance is, I think, the the bookend here to show crypto once and for all that regulation is here to stay. Tom, I also think it's telling that crypto arose during the Trump administration. I, that was partly by coincidence. Crypto arose really because interest rates were so low and people were looking for, for ways to play around with money. So they played with it in crypto. But it arose in that time when the Trump administration was here. And it really didn't want to get involved in putting too many regulations around crypto. So there was a lot of abuse that happened in crypto. And now, finally, when the Biden administration came in and Gary Gensler at the SEC and everybody else, at the CFTC and FinCEN and the Justice Department taking a much more serious attitude towards corporate crime, uh, they were not afraid to put regulatory enforcement behind a new sector. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. There are debates in Congress about should there be new laws to govern how crypto is or isn't regulated. And I have seen several Republicans in Congress saying, well, clearly this shows we don't need new laws because the current laws are doing a good job of hammering the really big crypto scoff laws. Finance is certainly the biggest crypto scoff law we've seen yet. And so I don't know, maybe they're right that, uh, Maybe we could get away with existing regulations to expand the area of enforcement to this new part of the financial sector. But it's still part of the financial sector. It still needs to be regulated. And right now it is. I'd like to maybe end with uh, an open-ended question that I'm not quite sure if, if there's an answer to or what mine might be. But are there lessons here for the chief compliance officer at a U.S. public company or a large private equity firm? or other U.S. entity, or is this just truly an anomaly starting with a fine and penalty all the way down? There are some takeaways for other people dabbling in cryptocurrency or sectors with high sanctions risk. I put it that way, that 
uh, one of the big issues with Binance was its failure to implement effective geofencing controls. Basically, that is identifying the IP addresses of your customers and then blocking them if their IP address suggests they are somewhere in the world where you're not supposed to be doing business. I have seen that time and again as I've written about smaller enforcement actions from OFAC, uh, where you know their geofencing isn't in place, and so they're not blocking IP addresses from Cuba or Iran. It could also work the other way around, that in theory, Binance should have been blocking IP addresses from the United States because it was not allowed to do business in the United States. And yet, they were giving advice to people to set up a VPN, and that's how you can evade the US IP address blocking. Um, so there's a lot there for people who are in virtual currency or people who would need to do pretty sophisticated know your customer due diligence. Uh, you could think about that and how would you implement know your customer programs. I will admit for a lot of like the Fortune 500 who have been dealing with corporate compliance for years, I don't know that there is anything here for them to learn because I think a lot of compliance officers at those non-financial giants in oil and gas or healthcare or pharma, you'd probably look at these settlement documents and be aghast at what CZ and his compliance officer thought they could get away with. And I bet most CEOs and compliance officers would say, there's no way on earth we would ever be so dumb as to do this. CZ and Samuel Lim and a couple of others over there clearly thought the rules didn't apply to them, and uh, they are now in for a rude awakening as the rules have applied and it's not a pleasant experience. Well, Matt, that sounds like uh, as good a place as any to end this episode. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to revisit this issue in the future. Thank you, Tom. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the award-winning Compliance into the Weeds. If you've enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review wherever great podcasts are listened to. If you'd like to join Matt and I, perhaps for an episode, shoot me an email at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. The award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the only podcast network in compliance, the Compliance Podcast Network. Thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to visiting with you again next week.